we start the program with an attorney at law. Now, before we begin delving into the ramifications of Muslims and the TTPS wearing prescribed head coverings, we are going to walk up to the line and peep over it. What do I mean by that? Well, we will find out momentarily. Jason Nathu is here. We say good morning. Hi. Thank you so much. Good morning. Thank you very much, DK. No, the call fire hairstyle case, we'll call it that. Mm -hmm. What can you say about it? And what are some of the ramifications of just diving willy-nilly into speaking about it? Right. Well, first of all, I would say that we really don't know enough to really come to any informed judgment on the issue. Certainly, it seems that something was posted on social media and the public has jumped on it. I would say that there is a bit of a danger in that, again, without having all the facts, we just seem to have one side of the story or what is purported to be one side of the story. We don't even know if that is an accurate um, depiction or description of, of what has happened. The company has issued a media release and I thought that the media release was very measured and we'll see what happens next. So the, you, you said a media release was issued by the company, a measured one. Uh, in terms of people actually taking up that story, what they think is the total story and running with it, what mm -hmm. are some of the implications when you try a case in the court of public opinion versus in the court of law? Well, I think social media has opened up new avenues of what is called defamation, um, where you damage the reputation of a person or a company, any individual um, in the minds of the public. And social media now presents a new dimension in terms of being able to do that very easily, sometimes supposedly anonymously. And I think it, it, there are lessons because certainly when it comes to, to posts, it's something that is written. Even if you post something out or you tweet something out, you can't take it back. In this particular example, I believe I've read, again, I don't know whether this is accurate or not, that the supposed employee would have posted something and then deleted it. But what he posted, screenshots were taken of it, photos were taken of his initial post, and that was then retransmitted by various entities, and the public has now jumped on that, but those are retransmissions of his original or his supposedly original post, and I think it's um, all sorts of accusations are being made against a company without the public or anyone really knowing um, what, what actually happened. And, and there is certainly a danger in that because I've read many, many volatile statements online over the weekend in relation to this. When we have the public being able to become content creators, so much so that we have media houses asking people to send in their content and adding it to their newscast. Is there a different set of rules that apply to the media versus individuals in terms of actually taking action against them for I, defamation? I, in terms of defamation, it's a very dynamic area. So technically, you can take action against anyone who um, creates this impression in the minds of the public. Um, whether a uh, claimant would bring an action against ordinary persons, I suppose it depends. Um, a media house that has a facility to incorporate contents on a, on a web page, as an um, addendum to an article that's posted, etc., may be inviting trouble. You see that um, people are sued, media houses are sued every day for letters to the editor, purported letters to the editor, because there has been this lack of fact-checking on the part of the media house before they publish the article. And I mean, in a case like this, you would have certain persons who have more weight than others, the supposed activists, the supposed, supposed bloggers who have a following, and they may influence some um, persons to think in a negative way against a company or against a person. And perhaps those persons may be um, someone, those persons would be more likely to bear the brunt of liability in defamation matters like this involving social media. Shifting a little bit from here, style or the call fire case to a case that you actually brought an action with, with a security officer wearing a particular sort of hairstyle. Yes. Uh, can you speak to that? Thank you. Sure. So this is a matter that was brought by a complainant in 2014 before the Equal Opportunity Tribunal. The complainant in this matter was a Muslim woman who was employed as a security guard at a, a, a security company. 
what happened in terms of the facts in that matter, the, the employee converted to Islam during the course of her employment. The facts or her facts were that she asked for permission to wear her hijab that was denied to her and the defendant company would have made all sorts of um, given all sorts of reasons for why she would have been denied that opportunity citing its uniform policy and several other things she brought an action before the equal opportunity tribunal via my office which is the hewitt law school the law school has a legal aid clinic which is available for persons who don't normally have the means to to support bringing any type of legal action or to obtain legal advice. It's, it exists for two reasons, for financially challenged members of the public, but also and more primarily for our students to learn from working on those matters. You know, there are two types of legal aid systems in this country. The state has a legal aid system where there is a minimum threshold, a qualifying criteria that's very much, very often beyond the means of the average person. And then we tend to take matters that are a little bit above that means that, that means um, qualifying criteria. I mean, a person might be making something like $10,000 a month, but still have so many expenses that they can't afford legal um, protection. So we tend to be able to act for persons in, in that bracket. And as long as our students can learn something from working on those types of matters, then it's something that we may very well take. We charge a small fee, but it's really a twofold objective, the, the community service and also the educational opportunity for our students. So this particular complainant would have been referred by the Equal Opportunity Commission to the legal aid clinic at the law school. She came and we then prepared the documents, we filed her complaint, and the tribunal process was very similar to that of the civil proceedings rules and courts, where we would have had to launch what we called the complaint, which is equivalent to a statement of case or claim form in the, in the high courts. We would have had to put in witness statements, put in all our documents, etc. The defendant, the respondent rather, would have had to put in a, a response. And then that evidence was adjudicated before the tribunal, and the tribunal eventually gave its decision in favor of the complainant. One of the things you just spoke about is wanting to take cases or provide opportunities for the Hugh Wooding Law students to learn. Yes. What would have been some of the things that they would have learned from this case? Well, we have a human rights law clinic at the law school where, you know, we try to teach them basic human rights concepts, discrimination certainly being one. Um, this would have been practice uh, action, practice in action, because the types of matters that we normally take, we, we have a very heavy family portfolio, a lot of things relating to divorce, children, custody, etc., uh, uh, on estates and probate portfolio, many actions in the civil um, arena. but. This would have been one of the first matters that the tribunal would have adjudicated. In fact, on the Equal Opportunity Tribunal's website, I see that we are the third of four judgments that they've had so far. So it was very new. Um, the students would have learned drafting, how to draft the documents properly, um, assessing the evidence that the client would have given to us and being able to put it in a format that was required for the courts and making sure that we had a proper case going forward. How far open does this precedent open the gate? And I ask that because, yes, we sing every creed and race finds an right. equal place, but at the same time, we've had more incidents than this that deal with hairstyles where people wanting to be, to be sent home from school. Right. Uh, I'm sure there'll be other people who find themselves in hot water with the head covering, depending on where it is they work. Mm -hmm. Well, we have the qualifier issue. Uh, how far open does this Senate? Because if, if, we, if we're doing it for one religious-based grouping, uh, what's to say that we have, um, say, like somebody who's a, a Bobo Dread, Rastafarian, right. and right. How, how far does this right. take us? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because it, re it really depends on the facts of each matter. Everything, you can't have a blanket um, policy or a blanket expectation on, on every single group that claims to be marginalized or perceives themselves to be marginalized. It really depends on the facts of each particular matter. You know, what should be noted is that the Equal Opportunity Act, which is the governing um, law for the Equal Opportunity Tribunal, refers to discrimination as something in which um, circumstances that 
uh, someone is treated either not the same or not materially different or less favorable than someone else is treated. So in this particular matter, for example, that is the matter that we would have brought before the tribunal, one of the principal tenants in our, our um, documents and our pleadings to the court was that this respondent had made certain accommodations for other groups. The respondent would have allowed Seventh-day Adventists to not work on a Saturday, but they didn't make that accommodation to our clients um, in, in terms of wearing the, the headdress. And of course, there were other issues as well. And of course, the, the Equal Opportunity Tribunal only has jurisdiction with regard to certain um, types of matters that come up in terms of the status of a person. That's the sex or gender of a person, the race of a person, the ethnicity of a person, the origin, including geographic origin of a person, the religion of a person, the marital status of a person, and certain types of disabilities of that person. Nowhere here is their hairstyle of a person. I suppose, you know, certain things could be imputed, whether a hairstyle necessarily could be attributed to a certain group. But again, that is an argument, and you really need to have proper evidence if you're going to proffer that type of, of statement. We uh, we, we're talking about a precedent that has been set with security services. Yes. Uh, what does this mean for other essential services, Defense Force, uh, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, and just widening that net? What, what are some of the implications? Well, I think there's a very big difference between a private security firm and an essential service that is um, funded and, and administered by the states. Um, again, uh, there are always concerns that would come into play. It's not a black and white issue. I saw that the um, Muslim police officers have made some sort of request to the Ministry of National Security. We really have to wait to see how that organization will deal with it. When it comes to issues of national security, of course, the states um, can make policies in the best interest of, of national security. This is not a private entity. Um, and no right is really absolute. We've seen that in jurisdictions like France very recently, they've banned the burkini um, in Cannes. We, we know that they have um, banned headscarves in, in, in France because of the threats or the perceived threat of terrorism. So the state can um, make certain regulations in what they think is the best interest of national security. So I don't think that you can really equate what happened with a private security company, um, uh, an ordinary private employer with an essential service um, being administered by the state. We really will have to see how the state responds to it, etc. But in terms of grabbing that example of the bikini being banned, mm -hmm. uh, how do we actually relate that to Trinidad and Tobago where there would be most likely a larger population of Muslims. Right. Like you said, it's a state-funded right. enterprise, so that means that taxpayers' money go right. into uh, how it is the operation should be run. So possibly they should have a larger say. Well, again, policies are normally made in the interests of national security, in the interests of health and safety, etc. I mean, I, I really don't want to comment too much on the women police officers and their matter that they're bringing to the Ministry of National Security. But, I mean, we don't know whether the, the, the ministry will say that, you know, having a head covering that is um, outside of the ambit of the uniform is some sort of compromise to national security. We, 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 we don't know. I mean, I, I, we really have to wait to see what happens in terms of that. All right, so we want to thank you so much, Mr. Jason Nathu, attorney at much. law, for giving us what you can without, try, without stepping over that edge. Thank you Because definitely much, it's something that is ongoing, and we wouldn't want to color the arguments either way. And in terms of the defamation, be careful what you post online. If you oh. don't think you, you should say something, then it's best to say nothing at all. Yeah, because the spent word and, and the shot arrow is very hard to get back, if, so. if at all possible. Yes. Stay tuned. Good morning, Trinidad and Tobago comes back with more. You do not want to miss what we have up next.